Ottolinger has been taking over the fashion world, coming out of the pandemic larger than ever and even had an endorsement from Blackpink. But who is Ottolinger and how did they manage to grow so quickly? Ottolinger was begun after Cosima Magadian and Christa Bosch met at the Basel School of Design in Switzerland. They realized they had the same vision of fashion and of life, and so decided to team up after graduation to put their vision out into the world. But it wasn't quite as linear as that. The pair had to show their graduate collection separately in 2014, of which I could literally only find this one image of Cosima's graduate presentation, despite the fact that her collection, which was called For Her, was nominated for the Swiss Design Awards in 2014. Whereas I couldn't find any concrete evidence of Krista's work apart from this mention on Sean Magazine's website, so I'm not sure which of these or if any of these are Krista's, but I thought I'd mention that it might be one of these. Post graduation, Krista went on to study law before deciding to begin her own brand, which has absolutely no evidence of online anymore, while Cosima, I believe, continued to work in design and graphic design before either revisited the idea of a partnership that was born in university. They moved to Berlin and began working together, but their first presentation as Ottolinger wouldn't be until the following year in September 2015, where they would present their first collection for spring 2016. The collection was presented in London in this monochromatic style that, as 032C mentioned, seems very hand-worked because of the lacing details, though still had many wearable garments, including their now signifier of printed mesh. The pair explained that this was purposeful as they were really trying to make Ottolinger well situated into its own world, its own zone, that in this collection made a statement on individuality and collectivism within that world. So this really is the first instance of something that they explicitly explain a little later that's very important to the Ottolinger brand, that this Ottolinger world is not a dystopian future, it's just a future world with all of the good and all of the bad that a holistic world would have. Obviously, the collection as a debut was very successful. It was featured in 032C, it was also featured on V-Files, though that's no longer online, and they mentioned in another interview that between this and the following season, they were already stocked by several stores, including Selfridges. So from here, it was a fast rise to notoriety for Ottolinger. For their Autumn Winter 16 show, they were selected for the V-Files catwalk show, which was an on-schedule New York Fashion Week slot which of course means more buyers, more stylists for further promotion after the show, and more customers being introduced to the brand. The show even had a feature on the Vogue website, as well as several others, so in terms of exposure, it was really impactful for a young Ottolinger. The collection itself furthered their theme of destruction more literally, with burnt holes throughout and a heavy distressing of fabrics, which will both go on to be themes in and of themselves, adding to the offering of the reconstructed-deconstructed theme of the previous collection, but in a way that's much more attention-grabbing and closer to their original concept for the brand, so in a manner that feels more authentic. This development, importantly, also made for an interesting way to approach heightening traditionally commercial garments to make them really appealing to a buyer or customer, which of course would help the brand financially through sales. So it's no wonder that from here they were picked to present on the maid catwalk for the next two seasons on their New York Fashion Week spot. The Spring 2017 show was a nice continuation of the brand's main themings, signifiers and ethos, yet it was the Autumn Winter 17 show that was more pivotal to the evolution of the brand for two main reasons. The first reason being that though this show also premiered in the Maid show in New York, which though I know happened I couldn't actually find any footage of, it was then shown in Paris Fashion Week in this installation. The location introduction was pivotal, as from here, Paris Fashion Week would be home to the brand even to this day, and honestly, contextually it seems like here is where they fit best. They're edgy and modern enough to stand out on the Paris circuit, while their vision isn't really as commercial as you may see in New York. So by moving over, they added more on-brand context in which they display the perfect blend of commercial and creative clothing in the way that Paris today really enjoys. The second reason was a development on the product offering in the introduction of bags. These bags, known as the ceramic bags, are actually usually made of a surprisingly sturdy rubber while having an almost gummy-like texture that really made them stand out. This then in turn catalyzed their popularity because though they began completely unbranded, the materialization is so unique and perfectly on brand that they're easy to identify regardless of the lack of a logo and so naturally became an immediate hit with their customer base. 
all of which, symbiotically with the Paris Fashion Week show, work to improve the popularity of Otterlinger, as evidenced by the extreme amount of images I found to show you of this collection, and yet they still weren't on the official Paris Fashion Week calendar. For the next two collections, the brand continued off the official calendar, exploring their themes of deconstruction, reconstruction, distressing, burnt elements, and now rubber, which came back in bags for both collections, on shoes for spring 18, and was even incorporated into jewellery for autumn winter 18. Both of these as developments for the brand's rubber product offering were significant. Yet, while I don't think the shoes were for sale as the collection came into stores, the jewellery was, and would be successful enough for it to be a running theme for many seasons, even to this day, albeit without Joanne Burke, the original jewellery collaborator slash designer. Though in fairness, that's probably because Joanne has a thriving business of her own now. So, while they were not yet on schedule, the world of Otterlinger was being expanded upon, and they had begun to grow a cult following that was hard to ignore, especially with their bags, as you can see from this video from Kristen Bateman. All of this helped propel the brand into financial stability. They were able to register as a limited liability company with 25,000 euros in share capital in Berlin, and they were nominated for the LVMH Prize in 2018, which, though they didn't win, the win that year went to Masayuki Ino of Dublet, even just the nomination exposed them to a huge new audience. Otterlinger as a brand was now hard to ignore. And so finally, their nurtured notoriety finally managed to score them onto the official Paris Fashion Week schedule for their Spring Summer 19 collection. This collection really firmed up their previous themes into something that was now concretely branding for the company. To quote their first Vogue review, it was denim exposed to both acid and flames, jersey that appears split apart and then draped or braided anew, flared jeans with crossover fronts, and an excess of lacing and knotting similar to Kimbaku. The collection received wide acclaim from critics, and it's easy to see why. Their vision now felt developed and unique, very fresh to Paris, meaning that, quite rightly, their stockist list exploded. They were stocked by Farfetch, LNCC, Machine A, Kith, and Essence, amongst over 30 well-respected stores around the globe. I think this was very likely helped by the fact that this was also their most commercial collection to date by quite a margin. The distressing and burning, while present, was lessened, and just generally the clothes more closely resembled the garment that they began as. This quite dramatic shift in their product offering, which really never went back to how it was before in any future collection, I'm attributing to the LVMH prize, which, though I mentioned they didn't win, would have had them in the same room as people that are really influential business figures who may have encouraged them to develop their product side more with a shopper in mind instead of a stylist, especially now that their couture, custom clothing side of the business, was probably less profitable than their ready-to-wear side. This afforded them accessibility for consumers, which naturally bore a hard upturn in exposure for Otterlinger as they continued to expand on their product offering, which, quite frankly, for Otterlinger does feel more natural than most. For example, in spring 2020 alone, we saw the introduction of suits, lipsticks made by Canna Swiss CBD, and these straw bags that were covered in the Otterlinger trademark rubber. Here you can clearly see that the vision of the brand is so secure and the signifiers are so developed and malleable that it feels as if they could have been there forever, which of course means that it has more chance of resonating with their client and being successful in retail. Auto Winter 2022 had wonderful evolutions on suiting, a significant expansion on coats, and more notably on bags in which this collection was very bag heavy with several new designs that most of the models showed. Specifically, at least two styles were new, one in felt and one in what I assume is leather, but it does appear to be metal. So seemingly, Otto Linger were on the trajectory to be the next major brand. At least, until Corona hit and put a halt to everything. In honesty, the Spring 21 collection was their weakest by far. I did enjoy the reimagining of the straw bags from before with these rubberized handles as opposed to a rubberized body, but as a whole, the collection was quite lackluster. And yet, despite their least interesting collections shown to date, extremely shortly after this would come probably the biggest breakthrough for the brand. Blackpink released the music video for Love Sick Girls, and in it both Jisoo and Jenny, two of the most popular members of the band, wore Otterlinger looks for the first time. But what made this more noticeable than most was that this music video had a lot of extra press for having a controversial scene in it. 
I obviously can't show you because of the copyright, but in short, Jenny wore a nurse's outfit and some felt that it was over-sexualized, causing the video to be re-edited and re-released on the 7th of October 2020, shortly after the spring 2021 Otterlinger collection debuted. The perfect time for Blackpink fans who may not have known about the brand to become aware of Otterlinger. We all know K-pop fans have a strong affinity for their biases and this dramatically converts into sales and media value and is well documented as doing so. However, because of their unrivaled commercial influence, sometimes this means that they are used by bigger brands and it doesn't always feel so authentic. A good example of this, though I like it, is Jisoo's ambassador role for Dior. I really adore Jisoo and I also really like Dior, but I don't think that Dior have that bad bitch aesthetic that Blackpink are so famous for. I know sometimes Blackpink wears more wearable clothing on stage and in music videos. Even the necklace that Jisoo is wearing with the Otterling address in the Love Sick Girls music video is Dior. But for the ambassador role specifically, it seems a little opportunistic of Dior when there are other really well-loved K-pop groups that are just a little bit smaller that actually fit much better with the Dior aesthetic like Twice or Yota Tingu or G-Friend. It feels like Dior just picked Jisoo because she's the most profitable K-pop idol, not because Dior themselves align with her vision. So it feels just a tad inauthentic. Whereas Otterlinger really well fits into the black pink aesthetic. They complement each other very well. So generally seeing them together feels right. It feels very natural. Plus, though I'm sure that they did get these clothes for free, Otterlinger certainly doesn't have the budget to pay for placement in their videos, which means that they're very likely organically picked by their stylist for this video, which again, to me, seems like a more authentic celebrity endorsement, especially considering that they've gone on to wear Otterlinger a few times again after this. Honestly, this is a discussion I could have forever about authenticity and K-pop, especially with the Western brands using them for their popularity. But we must now move on to Autumn Winter 2021, where they had arguably one of their best collections so far. They developed their entire clothing line by padding them out over several pieces in the collection, and they moved the rubber just from the bags now onto clothing with these body clips. They also conducted their first interview with my idol, Mima Fischlesio, in which they explained that the Otterlinger world, despite how often words are put into their mouth, is not actually dystopian. I mentioned it as important before, but here is where they very explicitly explain that yes, it is a future world, but it's a whole world with both good and bad elements in it, which clearly is an important distinction to make because of how often their work is falsely described as dystopian. It was a wonderful collection, just a huge step up from the previous one and a great overcoming of the troubles of making a collection in a pandemic. Especially impressive considering that this was shown a month and a bit before their collaboration with Jean-Paul Gaultier debuted. Obviously it's a huge deal that a company that is still relatively small like Otterlinger was chosen to collaborate with Jean-Paul Gaultier. But personally, I was a little disappointed with the outcome. The collaboration was just the one mesh outfit which though it played on their mesh stretch pieces that have been a part of the brand since the first collection, Spring Summer 16, it was just nothing really to write home about. Maybe I'd go as far as to call it a little bland, to be honest. The Spring Summer 22 collection was also very commercial. Not bad, of course, just not exciting past the introduction of sunglasses. While the Autumn Winter 22 collection, though also commercial, was much more visually interesting. However, it was in this collection that they would have their first, and I think only, scandal. On Instagram, a user called flesh underscore 003, who goes by the name Altuch, accused Otterlinger for copying their designs. Though you can see a similarity between the two designs, I don't think it's copying, only because, quite honestly, this has been done before in a very similar style before either had done this top. Even Aquaria on RuPaul's Drag Race wore a similar top on the mermaid runway look. So, though I do like both iterations, I also believe Otterlinger that they hadn't seen the flesh underscore 003 top before they created their own, especially considering they still have less than 5,000 subscribers on Instagram. Otterlinger did, however, put this message on their Instagram to tell people that Altuk had similar designs, so if they did like the Otterlinger one and wanted to see something similar, they could go to her, which I think was quite good of them, really. 
Meanwhile, on a more positive note, the Autumn Winter 2022 collection launched the Otterlinger footwear in collaboration with Camper. It's an incredibly wearable and affordable introduction to the brand for most. However, I know some people held back because it looked more trend-based than timeless, which is definitely a valid criticism. Personally, I really enjoy it. I think it fits so nicely with both the Otterlinger and Camper brandings. And I think Camper Labs is a really interesting business model as it is. So even if it's not necessarily what I was expecting, I really did enjoy it. I'm so excited to see the talented design work translate into something that I assume is really profitable for both, which of course then opened the door for something I was really not expecting. Shortly after this, they began presenting resort and pre-fall collections, upping their offering from two collections a year to four. Historically, having an extra two collections per year is an extreme amount of work for the designer and the production team too so you tend to only see it with much larger brands. For this reason, this seems like a great indication that the company is doing really well financially and is structurally stable enough to be able to produce literally double the work. This also comes with the added benefit that traditionally the in-between collections are often much more wearable and commercial than the more statement autumn, winter or spring, summer collections, which for Otterlinger may allow them to make more sales and differentiate their product-focused garments with their statement-focused garments, opening the door for a wider clientele. Because of this possible financial and structural security indication, before the new collection, Autumn Winter 23, was released earlier, I was honestly really curious if this was an indication that they're preparing the company for sale to a larger parent company, possibly LVMH. They haven't had something similarly this cool before, I know they tried to do it with Fenty, which I do have a full video on, but this edge really is the difference between Kering and LVMH. So I'm wondering if they're preparing for that, preparing to compete with Kering in that way. But of course, that is just speculation from me. Yet it does bring us onto the recent collection, Autumn Winter 23, that just showed earlier this evening. The collection was a nice continuation of everything that we could have expected from the brand. The branding and image of the brand is so well cemented at this stage that it's easy to predict what we'll see each and every time now, which of course is wonderful for the buyers as they can know easily what will sell. For example, in this collection, I again really enjoyed the bags. In this iteration, I thought that was really interesting and I really enjoyed the continuation of rubber-based elements on clothing. I'm very interested to see where Otterlinger will go from here, how they will evolve if they will sell. Personally, I would love to see how this translates to menswear as well. I think the suiting from this collection could give us an indication of that as well as the coats from previous seasons. There's definitely a market for an Otterlinger menswear line, but I'm happy to be surprised if they expand in other ways. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe and hit the notification bell for more videos like this one. And check out my video on Loverboy here, as well as my beauty channel. If you would like early access to any videos, I'll definitely recommend my Patreon as well, which is linked below.